I thought could be illustrated better is the three-dimensional aspect of the magnetic force because um, it uh, natural uh, the uh, this is something I say in physics four a when we do a rigid body rotation that when you are handling angular momentum, that especially with the motion like precession, that's when you have to deal with the full three dimensions. Because I don't know if you notice know this or not, very often we will limit the spatial dimension we are acting in into two. And very often we can do that. We can pick a plane where interesting things are happening and we describe basically everything two dimensionally. And uh, that works great in a lot of settings. But every now and then there are these circumstances where you need all three dimensions because you'll have vectors pointing in all those three dimensions. And what you see with the rigid body motion and motions that involve things like precession is there are vectors pointing in all three dimensions. And that kind of things happen when you have cross products somewhere where it's crucial. Um, and <laughs> that's uh, exactly the case with magnetic force. So the way magnetic force is expressed is as a cross product. The magnetic force that, oh wow, I haven't written it out here at all ever. Okay, <laughs> so let me go to the textbook section. The magnetic force in a very uh, most elementary interaction between a, a most elementary object that responds to magnetic field and magnetic field is, um, and the most elementary object, it's not magnetic charge because they don't exist. It's going to be an electric charge. And these electric charges interact with the magnetic field in this way. This is the most elementary interaction. The magnetic force is charge and this vector cross product with the magnetic field. And this uh, underlying mathematical structure leads to uh, features that you will see that really requires a three-dimensional treatment. And I think when you look at the demos that are here, um, I mean, you know, you see the um, you see the movement of the wire and that kind of gets you the sense of the direction. But I don't, I didn't think it demonstrated as uh, dramatically as possible uh, how how just uh, three dimensional magnetic force is. So I was looking to see what would uh, illustrate that. I mean, and I think the best. Uh, uh, thing I have uh, is this. I, I thought this video would uh, uh, be something that at least uh, replaces that uh, partially. So I'm not going to play the whole uh, 14 minutes of it, but let me play a portion of it to show um, what I mean. So let's see here. So I turn again so that I can point to different parts of the apparatus before you see the whole thing. So uh, where it was aimed at this, that's the main working part of the apparatus. Once I turn the lights off and turn this properly on, then you'll be able to see um, what it does. Um, I'm moving this around so that you can see the coils. These are the coils that generate the magnetic field. Um, they are in an arrangement called the Hamilton arrangement. I will uh, have it be part of your lab activity where you go through the analysis of magnetic field due to Hamilton coil. So, so these coils produce magnetic um, I'm going to skip ahead for a bit. Um, so there's a portion where I illustrate the beam and um, turn on the coils to bend the beam. And, and that's a more um, kind of clinical, uh, clinical um, presentation of the effect of the magnetic force that uh, I actually have a simulation that I think that will decently show that. So what I want you to show was, let's see, I think it's around, oh, maybe uh, let me, do, I think around here I'm moving around. So let me skip to that and turn back on the sound. It's moving in circle. It uh, kind of, if I move this around a little bit, you see the circular path comes. Uh, you can see that the circular path comes back to where it started. Now I can do this. I can turn this uh, bulb. I can tilt it a little bit so that the initial velocity of the charged particle is not perpendicular to the magnetic field. Then see what happens. That's the helical path that 
um, your textbook talked about. Let me increase the magnetic field a little bit so that there's a more room to uh, for the helical path to happen. So with this increase the magnetic field, that's uh, the helical path that the electrons follow. So interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, so for doing purpose of making measurements for this lab, I would make it so make it sure so that the path falls back to itself. It doesn't follow the weird helical path. Uh, so not weird, interesting helical path. Well not, well, not weird, interesting helical path. So that's uh, pretty much it. Um, in so, I mean, this is a fun lab to do in person, and there's a lot to learn and be careful about measurements. I'll try to capture some aspect of that in the um, in the activities that I still need to write up. Um, so for today, what I want you to end with is uh, some demonstration of the magnetic force. I mean, you have some in the recorded lecture videos, but uh, while I have this apparatus, there's uh, actually some things I can demonstrate. So, um, so this. Is uh, <laughs> you can already see I'm bringing something new. Uh, this is a neodymium magnet. It exerts a fairly large magnetic force. It it's, it produces a pretty large magnetic uh, field uh, compared to its size. And I can and this is like a bar magnet more or less. And I can use that to apply force on that ring. Like I can bring one pole closer reducing the magnetic field so making it so that the beam doesn't bend as much oh wait you can't really see it yeah maybe um or i turned it around and you can now increase the magnetic field so that the beam uh, curves more and um, there are other fun things you can do you can um i guess this isn't quite strong enough you, you can uh, use this magnet to repel the beam and there's a I think I posted somewhere about the magnetic bottle. That's uh, the principle. I, this is a bigger, stronger neodymium magnet. Um, the, that's the, there's a principle on which this repulsion works. The current, uh, the, the um, curious or the interesting thing here is that this repulsion, it happens with both poles. So right now I have one pole, which is repelling the beam away. And now when I turn it around, you can see that it's turned around because the way the beam um, distorts is different. It's the other way, but it's a still repel. Uh, it has to do the magnetic field gradient and it's kind of a cool thing. But um, I, I think this is easy, uh, better to see and play with in person. It, just looking at it through a video, it's, uh, I imagine it doesn't have quite the same impact. Um, so let me have that serve as an <laughs> advertisement for our next uh, uh, week's, um, uh, uh, not next week, sorry, I keep saying that, uh, next uh, in-person lab, which is based on this apparatus, and I have those strong magnets. And when you are manipulating the setup with those strong magnets, you also, uh, you can actually feel the force with which the electron pushes back on your hand. It's kind of, it's one of those things that you have to experience. Uh, first hand. So let me change my sharing setup again, I hope, um, for <laughs> better resolution and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the, um, it, it's the, this is the illustration of the kind of the complex, not, it's not really complex, but maybe unexpected, more rich, uh, interesting geometry of interaction between magnetic field and moving electric charges, which is the most uh, elementary object that can interact uh, via magnetic force. Um, and on that line, I thought, what would the uh, uh, you know, this is a fixed video, like, it takes a lot of work to change it. That's why I'm inviting you to come to the lab. Um, what I thought, and charging magnetic field is one of those things that 
There aren't that many good simulations of war. I think it it is uh, quite difficult to simulate well, um, because uh, really what you have to simulate is a three dimensional environment. So if it it's like uh, like doing a 3D modeling. You have to be able to click and drag. That uh, takes quite a bit of user interface work. And um, anyways, I looked around for a bit, charging a magnetic field. I didn't really find the exact thing that I wish I had. I think this is maybe the closest. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> not exactly. Um, it, it, I mean, it's quite simplistic um, simulation, but it at least gets at the uh, get gets at the different variations you could see. So, um, so right now what I'm simulating is well, nothing's happening. <laughs> the charge is at rest. There's no magnetic force, so nothing's happening. Okay, <laughs> so there's that. Um, we can make it a little bit more interesting. Um, the charge could be moving relative to the field or it could be moving parallel to the field that also nothing really interesting happens charge system moves it looks like it's moving under zero net force uh, yeah um so let's make it more interesting and this comes from where the magnetic force on the moving charged particle is a v cross b it's a cross product of the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. So when those two vectors are parallel, the cross product is zero. So for maximum uh, maximum magnetic force, you need the force to be, uh, you need the field to be perpendicular to the uh, perpendicular to the velocity. So this is illustrating the picture where, so the velocity of these particles are still the same. They are moving up on the screen and the direction of magnetic field has changed. It's pointing into the screen. So if you use right hand rule, do the V cross B, then you get that uh, V cross, the quantity of V cross B is pointing to the left. Uh, your left, which is uh, also the screen left. <laughs> um, it, it, so, so for the positive charge, the force it feels will be in the direction of V cross B. So this will start up uh, bending to the left. For a negative charge, the in the expression for the force, Q, the charge times V cross B, if the charge is negative, that reverses the direction. So this starts up bending to the right. And a chargeless particle will also feel no magnetic force. Uh, it's a, um, there's a connection between electricity and magnetism that will become more apparent as we go on. So let me just play the simulation, um, pause it in a little bit. Now, one thing you will see is that these charges are not just bending to left and bending to right. Um, and this is the interesting feature of the magnetic force. Because it's a V cross B, it's, a, um, it's not in a constant direction. If there had been a horizontal electric field, then this would uh, go in a parabolic shape, almost like a version of a projectile motion. Same thing with the discharge here. With a magnetic force, as the direction of velocity changes, direction of magnetic force changes as well. So it, they, it changes in a way that velocity and magnetic force are always perpendicular. And if you think about what other forces have you seen where force is perpendicular to your velocity, um, I hope that reminds you of uh, a centripetal force. And if you recall the coverage of centripetal force from physics 4A, centripetal force is not, um, it's not a particular type of force. I prefer to liken it to a type of net force. It's a kind, so, you know, net force, You what you get when you add up all the forces. And you call that net force centripetal force when certain conditions are met. And one of the conditions is that the force is perpendicular to the direction of velocity. And that has impact on the kind of a trajectory, whether the force can speed up the charge of the particle or not. 
And that's what you are seeing here. Um, so uh, as the time goes to infinity, these two charges will be going in circles. And uh, well, the neutral charge didn't feel any force, did, so it went off the screen. Um, let's see what else. Oh, let's try doubling the speed. Uh, see what happens. Mm. Yeah, larger radius. OK, would you have guessed that? I think it's uh, not immediately obvious, because you got uh, competing things here. So let me try to write this out. Um, so when you have larger velocity, you would expect um, a larger force, because you have the expression for the magnetic force being charge times V cross B. So if you're just focusing on, hey, I have a larger velocity, so I should have larger magnetic force, then it's easy to think <laughs> that your um, particle should draw uh, maybe a smaller trajectory because the magnetic force is greater. Now, you can't stop your analysis here because you are dealing with a circular motion. You also need to deal with the expressions dealing with the centripetal acceleration. So the centripetal force is uh, mass times the centripetal acceleration V squared over R. So you take a look at that, take the magnitude of this force, Q, V, B, and you realize, oh, yeah, um, even though the magnetic force went up by a power of one, if you wanted to keep this uh, particle moving at the same radius, um, as you your velocity was maybe doubling, because this is going as a square, not just a linear power, amount that your force increases is not enough. So, um, so if you solve this for R, you should get an expression that says something like R is proportional to V. And that is what you're seeing here. When you double the velocity, the radius that this circle goes in is doubled. Um, and it's a combination of two competing factors that your magnetic force does increase, but the, the amount of centripetal force that's needed to keep the path in a particular circle of some radius that also increases uh, as the square of the velocity. So, yeah. Um, and I think that uh, more or less it, you can, we can play with other um, parameters, but I don't know how much interesting that is. Um, and this is a kind of a visualization. Imagine you had, um, I guess, uh, uh, three ions. Uh, I don't know, singly ionized, doubly ionized, triply ionized oxygen, for example. Then this is uh, what you could see, maybe. Um, I, I think the challenge would be keeping them ionized. Or you could uh, have the same charge, but have them come in with a different velocity. I think experimentally this is easier. There are things called velocity selectors that can select the particular velocities of uh, velocities of uh, particle beam. Now, I hope uh, you notice something interesting here. So these particles are moving at different velocities and they are moving at different uh, circles of different radius. But as you look at it, uh, they remain in perfect sync. And I think it's uh, natural to ask this question. Uh, is this accidental or is there some way that this must happen? And my quick answer is, and this is the only reason I would be bringing this up, bringing this up uh, is that yes, there's a reason that they have to work this way. And um, I won't go through the whole derivation, but I'll just give you the phrase that you can search. And I think this is also covered in portable TA. The phrase you can search is something called the cyclotron frequency. And this uh, remarkable, I don't know, coincidence that in this uh, circular motion that's governed by magnetic force, that this uh, frequency of revolution doesn't depend on the radius or the velocity of the particle. That fact is used in particle physics um, to help uh, accelerate particles in a, like a circulating storage ring. 
and and uh, this uh, remarkable coincidence also kind of goes away when you get to high enough speeds that you have to worry about special relativity but um up to a sizable fraction of speed of light this is an effect that's really practically particle physics so I think that's uh, probably everything about magnetic force that I want to and can cover. Let me just uh, check to see. Um, I will have left some notes to myself to do that. Oh, magnetic bottle. Um, I guess, uh, let me just uh, flash this briefly so that I can show where it's coming from and maybe I can get a screen grab for later on. I just uh, scanned in a textbook that I uh, used uh, when I was undergrad. I think there's a past virtual class session where I showed the people this textbook. This is what I used when I was taking uh, this level of physics. I really like this textbook. Uh, this is also cheap. I think I got this particular copy for like $5 because 10th edition is out of date, but it's physics, it doesn't change that much. <laughs> so, and uh, I, I was assuming this forever, that every textbook covered this topic because when I took physics, it was covered. I really enjoyed that coverage. And um, it was only when I was teaching physics for me for like uh, second or third time that I realized, oh, this isn't really covered in other textbooks. Um, so there's the textbook that we are using this semester, which doesn't cover this. And it also wasn't covered in the uh, Gian Colley, which is the textbook that UC Berkeley uses. So it's the, uh, I guess uh, the way you would refer to it is as a magnetic bottle. It's a way to trap uh, charged particles um, in a, within a region, experimental region, without using any... Um, using any material. So this is a way to trap, like a, this could be a positron, an antiparticle of electron. You can't store that in, in any physical bottle because when the positron uh, collides with electrons in the physical wall, they will go undergo pair annihilation, they will disappear, so you can't do that. But you can trap positrons within a fixed region using magnetic fields. And it's quite amazing how it works. Uh, if you, you imagine these particles starting out with some velocity that's a perpendicular to magnetic field, then as we move, as they move in either way, uh, as they uh, drift a little bit to the left or drift a little bit to the right, they will experience this restoring force. That's kind of how V cross B works out to be when you imagine this uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field, strong at the ends and weaker in the middle, that um, the net force on these particles will tend to push it back towards the center region. And in fact, this is what you saw in the video that I played. You are basically seeing the one side of this magnetic bottle. And you can imagine if there being another strong magnet on the other side, then between those two, they, can, they have a, a possibility of trapping particle between those two strong magnets. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure this is not covered in our textbook. Let me just search to be sure. Because I think I remember checking this in some semester before and I don't remember seeing it in our textbook. Uh, so they do mention magnetic bottle, but I don't think they, yeah, I mean, they have this picture, which, all right, it's a kind of trapping also but they don't have that nice picture that you see um, you see my my other textbook. Uh, yeah, so so anyways, this picture, I just want you to show this picture because apparently it's not that commonly shown in other <laughs> textbooks, either ours or textbooks that other people use. 